Hey everybody, Christy Titus here. Thank you for joining me on my Girls With Guns Instagram takeover today. We're gonna be talking all things elk hunting, elk calling, and I hope you guys join me. I invite you to insert any comments that you might have down below, and I'll do my best to answer those questions, those comments throughout the course of this live broadcast. I'm broadcasting live from my home, so you can check out some of my beautiful elk behind me. And today I'm gonna to start out with kind of going over some of the basic types of elk calls. So when we talk about making elk sounds, that can be done with several different types of calls. So the first call I wanna talk about is what we call a pallet plate diaphragm call. Now this is a pallet plate diaphragm. This fits in your mouth inserted back and this is the actual pallet right here. Um, this is sometimes made out of metal um, and sometimes it's a plastic top. Originally, the original invention was actually with a spoon, which is super crazy. Uh, but this is your pallet plate diaphragm call. The other type of diaphragm call is a tone top uh, diaphragm. So this is a tone top diaphragm. It's got a more rounded plastic top. Um, these are both going to fit in your mouth a little bit differently. If you guys can see the tone top on this call is a slightly higher arch to it than on some of the pallet plates. And really what choosing the right diaphragm elk call comes down to is finding the one that fits your mouth the best. So I would never personally recommend to somebody like, hey, this is the only diaphragm elk call you will ever need. And to be really honest with you guys, um, I have a gazillion elk calls that I have used over the years and a lot of them for a lot of different reasons. Um, the construction of these calls, they each have the latex a different thickness. They'll stretch the latex um, to a different um tightness and then sometimes they'll even do things like putting multi layers of latex on the call which all give a different sound a different pitch um, the other notable difference in a lot of these calls is on the actual width of the pallet plate call so if you're looking at for example this one um, people think oftentimes a little incorrectly if you trim the tape on these calls they'll fit your mouth better um, trimming the tape on the calls can cause air to pass through and incorrectly over the latex, throwing the tone and the pitch of the call off. What I want people to really pay attention to on the sizing or width of a pallet plate call, for example, would be um, the point from here to here. Um, that point right there specifically, so let me put my phone down, here to here, obviously is a certain width. And if you look at another call, like this is a competing call, it's slightly narrower from start to finish. So how that call fits in your mouth, it's not that women have a narrower mouth, for example, it's not a gender specific issue at all. There are men with narrow mouths and then there are women with narrow mouths and there's kids with narrow mouths. So the width, from a construction standpoint, and every person's gonna be a little bit different. So I always recommend you try several diaphragm calls. Find out if you like and prefer the plastic tone top diaphragm, or if you're like me, and you might prefer the pallet plate uh, diaphragm call. Now, I have my own signature line of calls. My um, cow call and bull call, or diaphragm call, is called the Wild Fury, and funny enough, I named it after my horse, <laughs> um, but this call is slightly more narrow edge to edge than the traditional uh, pallet plate uh, diaphragm call. So for those of us that have a little bit narrower mouth, it might fit in the roof of your mouth a little bit better and allow you to achieve uh, more realistic sounds a lot easier. So um, it just depends on the person, right? So wide or narrow, just depends. What I typically do on a wider mouth call um, even though it doesn't fit the correct way in my mouth by sitting straight up in the roof of my mouth, I actually learned over time to cant these calls sideways. So I can still create realistic sounds. And this call is actually sitting in my mouth canted at an angle because it doesn't fit straight up and in the roof of my mouth. So. 
you can learn to use these calls and um, even if the, the width isn't exactly perfect. Um, so that kind of talks about diaphragm calls. And with a diaphragm call, you're gonna use those to make cow and bull sounds. So, to bull sounds as well. So, your diaphragm call is a key to both bull and cow sounds. Conversely, let's talk a little bit about um, external reed cow calls. External reed cow calls, there's a lot of different constructions. Uh, my external reed call is called the wild bang. And da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, just like the song. Get it? I don't know. Um, but there's lots of different external reed cow calls out there um, that all create a little bit different sound. Basically, it's using a false tongue. These are really great external read cow calls are great for people that have a gag reflex and have a really difficult time using a diaphragm call. Although, with that being said, Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls is doing a really good job of trying to manufacture calls that sit a little bit farther forward in your mouth so that it doesn't uh, enact that gag reflex that a lot of people get. Um, from a cow call or a, a diaphragm call, I should say. So here's your external read cow call. It's really simple. You apply some pr uh, pressure with your lip to the actual call along with a blowing motion and it creates a cow sound. So um, these are really great creating cow sounds as well as kind of that more nasally estrus sound. Um, so I really like to use these peak rut, pre rut, doesn't matter when, I just like the, the sound of it. It sounds really good. Carries a lot of sound throughout the woods. So where my cow call on the diaphragm side, I can kick down to make really tiny sounds, really quiet sounds. Now the external reed cow call is going to give you a lot of volume to create those cow sounds. So mine's a Rocky Mountain hunting calls. It's called the wild thang, T-H-A-N-J. Check it out. I've got lipstick on mine because I'm so awesome like that. So you can see the wide range of sounds that you can get from this one call as well. The next thing I want to talk about is bugle tubes. So there is a lot of trains of thought on bugle tubes and there is a lot of bugle tubes on the market. Uh, my personal bugle tube is called uh, the Wild Frenzy bugle tube. Couple design features on this bugle tube. Um, first of all, the overall length of this tube is slightly smaller than some of the ones you'll see from Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls. Some of our Bugles are really big. Those really big tubes are super great because they provide a lot of volume. To me, they're just big. Um, I love this bugle tube. You still get a ton of volume from it. And I can strap it around my neck and lay it alongside my backpack here and then just flip it around and actually bugle while I'm in the field, no problem. Um, without compromising any volume. And the other thing we put on my bugle tube, um, the Wild Frenzy, is um, the uh, tone taming system. So I can open up this tube to where I have a lot of volume, or conversely, let me just see if I can show you this, I can actually take this tube and um, close it like this. So those ports are closed and it'll kind of soften the sounds that come out of this tube. So you have a little bit of volume control with the tube that way. The other thing is a volume enhanced tone technology was, is like a spring inside. Um, and this really helps me hold my notes, makes them sound really good and crisp. Um, and the other thing with these tubes uh, that they're designed to do is create back pressure. Um, and what I mean by back pressure is if you were to take your diaphragm call and blow a sound or try to create elk sounds through like a toilet paper roll, there's not a lot of back pressure. And the sensation that you get from that a lot of time is that you run out of air really quickly. Um, so these are designed to create what's called back pressure, which keeps you sending air from your diaphragm out and through the call and you feel like you can hold and control your notes and the sound a lot more consistently. 
The other thing that's built into my tube, um, the Wild Frenzy, is a, a tone tamer. So it's basically like a giant rubber band that's on the inside of this tube so it doesn't end up with that tingy, echoey plastic sound. Um, so there's a lot of design features that go inside making a bugle tube, a lot more than might just kind of meet the eye. Um, but when you put it all together, when you take your external read cow call, your um, diaphragm calls in your bugle tubes, you can make an entire elk vocabulary. Um, so I'm gonna roll into talking a little bit about the elk language and what elk do and basic sounds and we'll demonstrate those sounds and um, hopefully along the way I get some questions from you guys I can answer. If you are catching this after my live is over, still feel free to key in your questions. I will do my best to answer those questions um, after this live broadcast has concluded too, so that everybody gets a chance to um, hopefully interact and, and have their questions answered. So let me grab a drink. And you guys can say hi to Zoe back there and Kruger. Those are my dogs. They're so cute. Beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Some people think Zoe looks like a dust mop. And she kind of does. Anyway. So let's talk about basic cow sounds. So cow sounds will be, um, we have what we call a mew, which is a sound that sounds like this. And when you are trying to make a cow sound like a mew, um, I roll my tongue on the call and that's how you make a sound. So you're rolling the top, that fat part of your tongue across this latex as you press air from your diaphragm over the latex. For this, I always try to tell people to start with making like an EO sound. So something like this. That's kind of co EO, EO. So imagine saying EO and how you would position your tongue in the roof of your mouth, and that'll give you a really good start on how to start making those sounds. Um, and I wanna invite you guys too, I have a whole YouTube channel, PursueTheWild.com, where I've got a ton of videos on how to pick a diaphragm call, how to pick a bugle, how to make your first cow sounds, how to make advanced cow sounds, how to make your first bugle, how to make advanced bugles. I've got Rocky Jacobson on there. It's a great series of elk calling info. And um, after this live is over, if you guys wanna you know, take your calls, go there. There's, um, you can listen to us make sounds and then it gives you time to replicate making that sound and practice it at home and then rewind and fast forward and do all of those things that you wanna do because you are in control of your life with YouTube. It's so awesome. So check it out. Um, but this is a cow sound. This is the mew. There's also a chirp, which is a sound. It's a little bit shorter sound. Cows will also make this sound. So so you end up with a mew and a chirp. Slightly shorter sound. Calf, elk make mews and chirps also. So they sound just the same, but like kind of like a baby. That would be a mew. A calf chirp would be similar. So the goal is, is we can create by learning to control our tongue across this latex diaphragm on the Wild Fury diaphragm call is what we would call herd talk. So let me give you guys a little example of herd talk. What I want to really preface with a lot of this is you guys can feel emotion. It's like listening to a singer. Morgan Mills is on here right now um, listening live. And Morgan, when you listen to her sing, you feel her in her songs. When she sings and she's passionate about something, it makes you feel passionate about that because you feel her energy. Elk calling is the same thing. We want to have energy and passion and emotion behind our sounds. So instead of sounding like this, we 
which for all intents and purposes is technically a cow mule. Let's give him some love and make it beautiful. Sounds much better to the ear and a bull elk that might be listening is thinking instead of this monotonous one sounded cow over there, it sounds like a beautiful symphony of a herd and uh, is much more likely for him to believe that there's actually real elk there. Now, when we do this, we can also add in that external read cow call. So something like this. And all of a sudden, it sounds like the woods are erupting with a fantastic herd of elk. So that is some of your basic cow, calf sounds or herd talk sounds. So um, let me go into one of the next sounds that both cows and bulls make, which would be the elk bark. This is the official butts and dust call, and when you hear this, it can really be a problem. Um, but let me let me uh, demonstrate this sound, and then we'll talk you through some scenarios where if you hear it, you might be able to recover your hunt. So hold on a second. This is the bark. <coughs> so if you hear that sound, typically gigs up. The elk have caught your wind or they saw you, something they know is just not quite right. They're not into the jam at all. Their necks are up. If they were feeding, they've stopped feeding. They're now onto the game. Um, so a lot of times if I have an elk bark, what I'll do is I'll do like a bark back. So if I hear this, Bow! I instantly fire back with, Bow! Or I'll do a bark to bugle. So if he barks, or she, bow, I might hit it back with something like this. Bow, bow, bow. So I go into a bark to bugle just to kind of get their mind off of it. Um, can work effectively. Uh, can save some hunts. I've had it save some hunts where if you, a lot of times, end up in a situation where you're on a bark off, where you'll bark, they'll bark. They'll kind of walk around and circle and they'll look around or they'll circle your wind or they're trying to figure it out and then they'll bark again and then you kind of do the same and you end up in this weird deal. But it can buy you some precious time to possibly give you that opportunity to make a shot. Um, so it's not game over when you hear that sound, but it's not a good sound. So let's all try to avoid that. Keep the wind in our face. Yes, so let's talk a little bit about bull sounds. So... We talk about bulls, they have such a wide vocabulary. Like, I'll be really honest with you. Sometimes my dad's bugle is like super aggressive. He sounds like Satan of elk on the mountain. And I'm like, ah, dad, you're, you're being so aggressive. What is going on? But sometimes it doesn't matter what your bugle sounds like. Sometimes they just answer. So... For me, it's really important to be convincing with your cow sounds and bull sounds as well. However, there are bulls that get really raspy and gnarly sounding at the end of the year. And I want to just preface a lot of this too, is you can't judge a bull by his bugle. Um, if it sounds like a big bull does not mean that it is a big bull. Cause I've had some really young satellite bulls sound like they are going to eat my lunch and they're tiny. They, they walk out and you're like, how did this thing just make that sound? Wah, they do. Okay. So stop judging bulls by their bugle. Um, and just hunt them all because it's awesome. Just go after it. If you hear one, go for it, especially if you're on public land. Mm. Let's talk about sounds. Location calls. So location calls, we're going to be like, where are you? Where are you? And this is the thing with a location call. If I use a location call to locate a bull, I usually instantly shut up and I try to get closer to that elk. 
Um, if I have an elk respond to me, depending on how he responds, um, I'm typically, I don't stay put. Typically I use that as an opportunity to figure out which direction the wind is blowing. For example, in the morning, if I'm on top of a ridge and I get a bull to bugle below me, like answer my location call, I know for the next couple hours, potentially, my thermals and my wind are gonna be going down. So I'm gonna use him locating back to me as an opportunity to drop an elevation, get below where I think he is, and continue the game from a standpoint of where I'm gonna have a tactical advantage. So location call, you have lots of location call sounds. So here's a one note bugle. Um, one note bugle, just high to low. Hey, I'm here. Where are you? No big deal. Chill, non-aggressive. Uh, two note, three note bugles. So I started with kind of a mid pitch, went a little higher, came back down, and then there's like a growl to high bugle, or you can call it a three note bugle. Starts a little growlier in the bottom and then goes up and then comes back down. Everything goes up and comes down or starts high and then works down. So. So one, two, three note bugle, all what I would consider location calls, all are pretty non-threatening. Um, you guys, if you've elk cutted much, you've been in a situation where you're like, wow, I had these two elk and they just located back and forth all day long. One would bugle on this ridge and then pretty soon the next one would bugle on the next ridge and they just kind of chilled there all day long. Well, in my mind's eye, when I'm in that situation, I'm thinking of it like this bull over here might have two or three cows. And this bull over here might have two or three cows and neither one of them really wants to fight and they kind of want to just know where the other one's at and stay out of each other's way. I'm over here with my girls, you're over there with your girls. And a lot of times with those elk are consistently location bugling to you. If you put pressure on them, a lot of times they'll pick up their cows and move away from you because they're just locating at that point oftentimes to just figure out where the challengers might be. They want to avoid it and they're gonna a lot of times move away from that pressure. So for me personally, if I have a bull locate bugle in a really non-aggressive way, then I'm probably gonna try to slip in on them, um, potentially do some cow calling or some really, really light bugles potentially. We'll see, you know, how the mood goes. Um, Calling bulls away from cows can be really deaf. Um, so it, it all depends on the mood of the elk and how you feel in the moment. And so I can't always say like, there's always a finite answer to everything. But for me personally, if I have a bull locate, the first thing I wanna do is close the gap. Um, if I close that gap and I fire back with him with another locate bugle and he's moved away 300 yards, um, or he's moved up over the next ridge, I know he does not want to fight. Um, and that's going to really change the strategy that I'm putting out there on how I'm going to hunt that bull. I'm going to hunt him uh, not with another aggressive bugle, but I'm going to try to hunt him by getting close, just keeping ears on him, see if I can get him to answer a cow call. Um, a lot of times these bulls can't hear your cow talk from a ridge top. So if I can figure out where he's at, get close, start working those cow calls and see if I can get him to respond that way, giving away his location, um, then I'm going to hunt him and work in on him that way. Um, it's all a strategy game and you, you're you guessing at the end of the day, right? Um, and there's always those times when you look back and you're like, wow, I wish I'd have done that differently. <laughs> Uh, so let's continue on some of the sounds. So I'm going to go into um, a display call. And so this is a really cool call that is typically heard with a bull with a herd of elk. Um, the dominant bull often will display call and there might be three, four, five other elk, um, bull elk in with that same herd bull and they don't say a thing. They don't call, they don't make sounds. The dominant bull is doing the display calling. The other ones are just pressing their limits on being in the vicinity. They're hoping to 
um, pull a cow away and um, create their own herds or have an opportunity to breed. Um, but the dominant bull will do the display call. So if I hear a bull display call, I instantly go into the strategy of, okay, if I can keep him locating and slip in with the conditions in my favor, there is potential that I can get in undetected, challenge him when I get close and try to force him to come close enough for a shot. Or I can even work the concept of, okay, well, maybe I can't get close enough to the herd bull, but maybe I can call away a satellite bull. Um, so satellite bulls are typically a lot easier to call in than that big dominant herd bull. So um, you can play that scenario how you want, but when you hear that display call, I would al always imagine that there's going to be eyes on you as you get closer. There's going to be other ears paying attention and just always approach with that extra level of caution um, and, and trying to get everything perfect in your favor. So here's your display. I'm going to put my phone down here. Oh, maybe not. So with that, as like the lip ball, um, starts out with a normal like three note growl would have at the beginning and then it goes into the lip ball. That screamy lip ball is typically the sound of a bull that's got a wore out throat. He's, you know, been displaying, he's walking around screaming, uh, checking cows for estrus, tipping his horns back. You'll see that bull urinating on himself. Um, so these are, he is showing that he's dominant. And um, a lot of people, you know, when they hear an elk bugle in the woods, they think, oh, well, he's talking to other bulls. Well, that's not necessarily the case. So if you think of it in this perspective, if one bull's locating on one mountain and another bull's locating on another mountain, perhaps there's a cow that just slipped into estrus that's not with either bull. Well, she's going to then be able to choose which bull she's going to go to. And cows will go to bulls. Same thing when a cow elk hears a display call. She's going to know by that sound that that is a dominant bull. And just the way genetics work internally in the bodies of females, we all want to breed a dominant male. Elk are the same. Um, so a uh, that's why those bigger bulls end up with herds and harems of cows. Number one, the other bulls don't want to fight them. They're the biggest. They're the strongest. They're going to have the highest survival rate for their calves. The females will be drawn to those bulls. So if you have a bull that's display calling, not coming into you, not answering your cow call, he doesn't have to answer your cow call and come in and pick you up because that bull knows to some degree females are going to want to go to him because he's dominant. So he'll display call and let you know as if you're making cow sounds like, hey, I'm here. If you want some of this, come get it. And it works. So that's when you use the tactical strategy of wind and trying to get potentially, you know, if you can set up as a caller and keep that bull talking and allow your buddy to slip in for a shot. Um, that on a, on a bull that's hanging up like that, that tends to work really well. Um, Going into another sound, um, let's talk about the challenge call. So challenge call is when two bulls are going to go toe to toe or a bull has a herd and the other bull comes in and is like, it's on, I'm taking your cows. Literally, it is a physical challenge. Um, it is a very aggressive bugle. And um, if I have a bull challenge call me, uh, game on. Um, so he wants to fight. He's ready to fight. He's fired up enough to fight. He thinks he's bad enough to fight. So it makes it a lot more fun and interactive hunt. If you can get a bull to do the challenge call, that means you are experiencing like super peak rep behavior. It's awesome. So here's my version of the challenge call. And I assure you there are people that do it better than me, but here we go. <laughs> It is, just think of the emotion that goes into that. It is a scream. The bull is not like, doo -doo -doo, bugling, I'm over here. It is energy and aggression, and, and that comes out in that bugle. You can feel it. Um, 
It is a very powerful sound. It is, they are angry and it's an awesome sound. It will take you down to your knees in the woods. It's so powerful. So that's a challenge. That tells a whole nother story. One thing I do want to go into too is the tone of the chuckle. Um, on elk, when they chuckle, it'll tell you different things. So if you think about this chuckle as like a love chuckle. That to me, if I hear a bull that does that type of tone of chuckle, that's like a love chuckle. Like, um, uh, uh, uh. oh boy, like he's lovesick. He just wants you. He just wants a cow. That's a love chuck. He's ready to breed. He's not, you can tell emotionally he's not in the mood to fight uh, versus something like this. So, versus faster, harder, more aggressive versus slower. Love chuck tells different stories. So if I hear a bugle with this, versus <laughs> to me two different moods two different stories i'm gonna hunt those elk completely different you know the first the first elk that's more aggressive, I might come back and be aggressive, rake trees, roll rocks, be loud, let him know he's firing me up, and hopefully he gets set off enough that my hunter gets brought in. Conversely, on the second bull, I might focus more on making those really hot estrus sounds, you know? <coughs> really focus on pleading to that bull that you want to breed too. So how I respond to different sounds of bugles will affect, or how I hear different sounds of bugles will affect how I want to respond, whether it's to call back, whether it's to sneak in, it all depends. Um, when you're calling elk or hunting elk, um, if you have that bull that's hanging up, the 80 yard hang up, 70 yard hang up, 60 yard hang up, whatever, depending on how thick it is, it is a real thing. Number one, the shooter should absolutely never make an elk sound ever because elk can pinpoint you exactly where you are. So if you're the designated shooter, don't make any elk sounds unless you're trying to stop an elk in a shooting zone, right? Or a lane, I mean, whatever. Um, no elk sounds. You have to trust your caller. As the caller, it's your job to move left and right in order to draw an incoming elk by uh, your hunting partner. Luckily, or hopefully, I guess you would hope that that animal's giving you either vocal sounds or you can hear it walking or something like that to tell you if you need to move. So you have to really pay attention to those tiny sounds too. Um, a lot of people make a mistake when an elk hangs up that they want to push forward to close that gap. At, for me personally, what has worked best is the opposite. So if I have a bull that's really hanging up and I know he's, you know, 30, 40, 50 yards shy of getting, uh, giving my, my hunter a shot, what I might do is actually move away from him. Um, pick up, move away. I might do it kind of aggressively, making bull sounds, raking, herd sounds, making it sound like this bull is pushing his cows away and sometimes on that hesitant elk that's down there hanging up, he feels relaxed enough like, okay, this guy's moving away. I'm going to move up and just kind of check things out. If they're uneasy and they're nervous, they're uneasy and nervous. If you push them, they're more likely to move away than if you pull away and bring him by your shooter. Um, really, really important. And chasing elk is a bad deal. I mean, I've done it. We've all done it. It's fun, but it's better if we can just give them that space, have them come in, um, and not over pressure them into, you know, out of, out of the country. So, um, I'm trying to think of some other things to kind of, you guys talk about. Um, I have so much in my brain. Oh my gosh, it's crazy. <laughs> um, another thing is patience. So, um, a lot of times elk want to bed down and they get quiet. And just because an elk shuts up doesn't mean it's left the country. 
And people, when you're hunting, you need to be mindful of that. So if I'm in a situation and I have a bull screaming all morning and then he just shuts up, a lot of times it's just because they bedded down. So that, as a hunter, gives you an opportunity to quietly, and keeping the hopefully the conditions in your favor, slip in towards where they were, where you think they might be bedding. This is where your Onyx maps are really going to come into play on your phone if you if you are hunting in an area without service, make sure you download your service into the offline mode, uh, your map into the offline mode so that you have that area downloaded. And then you can kind of see some train features that might be able to help you where you think that bull or his herd is and use that quiet time to slip down in carefully. Um, give them, you know, an hour or two. Just be quiet, chill, relax. Uh, and then start out a series after a little while with a couple of cow calls and see what happens. A lot of times people get in this huge hurry and they run into a spot where they'd heard a bull and they've all bedded down and pretty soon they blow the whole herd out. Um, so patience is really important with all things hunting, you know, um, just listening to what the elk are saying, listening to what they're telling you, um, being patient. And another thing is, um, you know, elk move really, really fast, um, uh, from their feeding to their bedding area or bedding to feeding areas. So, um, that is really important for you to try to get in front of them. It's very rarely a winning strategy to call to an elk's back. If I got an elk in front of me and I'm trying to call to his back, it is very rare, especially if they're going from bed to food or water or from food or water to bed. They have something in mind. They're getting there. And they move at a pace that is so fast that physically it's almost impossible to keep up with them. Um, it's very rare that I've had an elk where I've called to his back in that type of situation where he's actually turned around um, and came back. Uh, backtracked. So trying to strategize um, and get in front of them is really important. And I'm, I, I saw I had a couple comments um, and I'm trying to find where I can, um, uh, or questions, I'm trying to find them on here and I'm not seeing them where they went. So what I might do, um, uh, let me swipe this around left and right, see if I can find them. Um, yeah, I can't find my comments here. So I apologize. So when I'm done with this live, what I'll go in is try to go in and um, answer the questions that you guys are asking. So keep the questions coming. I'll do my best to answer them afterwards. Um, but calling to their back is typically not a great, not been a great strategy for me. Um, early season, you know, first week into archery season, the most effective strategy I've had for getting on elk is good scouting. Um, now in the velvet time, like right now, elk are in their velvet, they're in their summer pattern. The cows are with other cows and they're with calves and bulls are in bachelor herds or they're by themselves. So when you're scouting, you're not necessarily looking for large quantities of elk. You're just looking for elk sign. If I find an elk track, oftentimes I'm going to presume it's a bull. Um, finding those wallows, even if you find a fresh track of something that a bull or an elk, I should say, that has stepped into a wallow and not wallowed itself, you might have a bull that lives on that area surrounding that wallow. Um, just gives you a place to kind of go back to. Opening weekend is really your weekend um, to create um, that basic herd talk, knowing that the elk, those bigger, more mature bulls, are probably not with a lot of cows. They're probably still in bachelor herds. It's a really great opportunity for you to set up and do some blind call sets, knowing that whatever is going to come in is probably going to come in silent. Um, doing some herd talk and some really non-aggressive bugles, like trying to sound like a spike bugle and just really super non-aggressive bugling and, and herd talk just to pique the curiosity of those bulls. You certainly can call in those early season bulls with that approach. Um, they're having a biological change. So right now they're in the full velvet they're in bachelor groups, they're in, um, or by themselves, cows are with calves and young satellite bulls. Uh, around the 15th of August, pretty much nationwide around that frame, time frame, they'll start shedding velvet. Once they start shedding velvet, 
you guys will start to see bowls start to do the breakup where the bachelor groups start becoming a lot smaller. So maybe there was three or four or five bowls all living together over the summer. Now you're going to see, you know, maybe two bowls together or some singles. They're starting to break up. They're starting to establish, you know, their territory dominance. They're going to shed their velvet and their behaviors and the, what they're thinking about in their life cycle is obviously changing. Their hormones are changing. Um, and once they go hard horned, their pattern is really, um, uh, becomes unpredictable. So, um, that first weekend of season, if I can spend some time really establishing their summer pattern by that first weekend, a lot of times those bulls are still in the same general area. So I can use that to my advantage, sitting water holes, um, targeting those benches and those ridges that those bulls were at during the bachelor season. Um, once people start hunting and they start kicking around those elk, and once the cows start estressing, those bulls are going to be scattered. Um, they're going to be dropping in trying to find those cows. So if you know where there's cows and calves and, and maybe some spikes, that's also good to know because there eventually will be a more mature bull that comes in and picks them up. Um, some of those big bulls get super lazy. They'll wait for an uh, intermediate type age bull to do all the work, do all the rounding, and then they just come in during the good part and <laughs> steal the uh, cows from them. And that's a really good opportunity to pick up that bull that just got kicked out with calling. There's so much that goes into this. Um, peak rut strategies, pre-rut strategies. So for first week of season, I always recommend people know where their cows and calves are and also know where you have some bachelor bowls, um, depending on the hunting strategy you want to do. Sitting water is always good. Game trails is always good. Um, especially like these hot, you know, 90 something degree days. If you can find a good game trail on the way to food or water and you're willing to hunt some extra late nights, um, sitting those travel corridors, even if those elk aren't talking, um, is a really great way to tag a bull um, in, in an otherwise difficult to hunt environment. Cause they, they, a lot of times that first week of season won't answer you. So, um, just some basics for you guys. I hope you all have enjoyed, um, this Facebook live. I invite you all to go to my YouTube page, pursue the wild, check out my entire series on there. Go to my website, pursue the wild.com. Um, all my videos on there. I also have a website store where you can pick up my elk calls. If you guys go on my page and the Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls page, like both pages, I'm doing a, way, a giveaway this year where I'm going to be giving away a bugle tube, external read diaphragm call, and um, a regular diaphragm. So um, I invite you guys, Pursue the Wild is the name, Pursue the Wild and Christy Titus. Thank you guys for joining me. Good luck this elk season. I'll talk to you all soon.